So this is based almost entirely on an article written by Rafay Khan. Um, the link is here and it's also over there as well. Um, and it's, it's really well written and I feel like um, people will get a lot of mileage out of working through the examples on there. I kind of just took the images on that article and I'm going to talk through it as well as provide you some you know, additional insight as to how it all connects together conceptually. Um, the article, just be warned, has a lot of math on it, but the math is simple. It's not really hard. Um, the reason for that is because the numbers that you're utilizing is based off of the OR gate and the XOR gate, so zeros and ones. So it can give you some pretty steady uh, predictions on a very simple uh, input, and so that's kind of what we're going to be basing this whole process of building a neural network without any frameworks. Um, just, for you, just so that you're aware, we're gonna conceptually build it first, so I'm not gonna throw code at you immediately, but then once we're all squared away with the vocabulary and how everything fits together quite literally, then we're just gonna go into the toy example. And I've written the toy example all out, um, and if we have time at towards the end, which I think we will, we can extend the program a little bit and also try it with a different example that's more complicated. Okay, so um, this is actually, if, have you guys seen a neural network diagram before, just browsing through the internet or doing your own research? So this is a little bit different. Um, I don't know if you kind of see the Z. Yeah, it's, it seems pretty visible. Okay, that's good. Um, basically, we have a couple of, com uh, uh, quite a few components here and marked out symbols. And x1 and x2, and however many x's beyond that, are the input values. Um, like I said before, we're using a gate, an OR gate, so there should only be two. But in case you needed more, you can add more. It's arbitrary, uh, well, it's, uh, it can take in as many as you'd like. And then the w's are weights. So weights are pretty much the most, one of the most important parts of the neural network. It's what allows the mathematical data flowing in between the nodes to fire and point itself in the right direction so it can make correct predictions. Um, weights start at a random uh, kind of distribution, Gaussian distribution, um, and so that they can all kind of learn different features of input data, and we'll go over more uh, about that later. And they also get adjusted as the neural network goes over its iterations. Um, that process of adjustment in the weights uh, happens after forward propagation and during back propagation, towards the end of back propagation. Now, the weird part that if you've seen a diagram before is the Z. This Z is actually a lot simpler than it sounds. It's a linear uh, combination, which basically means that you take the x and the, the x input and the weights, multiply them together, and then add them to the other inputs and weights. So if you were to see what z did behind the scenes, it would go z equals x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2, cool? And then that sigma symbol, is our activation function and then it spits out the expected prediction. All right, we're gonna go over uh, activation functions now. Any questions before we move on? All right, cool. So this activation function uh, in this case is a sigmoid, but it can be a lot of different things. It could even be, I don't know, like a square wave. Um, there's a really, the most common activation functions isn't this guy, I don't believe, but for kind of uh, illustrating the example, we're going to use a sigmoid function. So this activation function looks like that mathematically and graphically, and you notice the kind of standout components to it. Number one, they are not, the lines being drawn is not straight, it's not linear, and number two, it sits between the y values, uh, sorry, the x values of zero and one. So this is important as we are going to see moving on that the data that's flowing in is going to be scrunched in between um, 
the, that values there is between zero and one. And that is why a lot of the times when you utilize a neural network, especially a simple one, it spits back out predictions in the form of probabilities between zero and one. And that happens because of this activation function. You can think of an activation function as whether or not a neuron should be fired or a node should be fired. It kind of, towards the end, decides, hey, should I activate or not? And this equation um, is the mathematical representation of that. So again, the standout important features, it's not linear, and it's in between zero and one, and it activates a node. All right, so let's go into our data. <laughs> it's just the OR gate. Um, so, so we can visually uh, see how this uh, kind of neural network is going to predict um, whether or not uh, a one should be predicted or a zero. It's just there on the graph. And you notice it could be done by hand, very easy. And on the right is the kind of the table representation of an OR gate. Now, this is a good example because we can see um, kind of intuitively the math on how it flows through the neural network. So that's why we decided to use with an OR gate. So um, well, I'm not gonna go too deeply into the math, but you can if you just look at the article that we have um, linked up on the board. Um, basically, when you first start off, we're just gonna look at the zero and the zero, just for the first iterate, uh, the first two sets of data points that we have is zero and zero on the table. And you notice that um, W1 and W2 already have a value, and that's 0.1 and 0.6, and that's because they're randomly initialized right out, the, right out of the gate. Then you can see the linear combination coming out um, in the center, and then that results in it being zero because everything is zero, so it just um, ends up that way. And then if you pass in zero into the sigmoid uh, function, the activation function, you get 0.5, pretty straightforward. So now that we have <laughs> our prediction on the first, um, basically the first forward propagation, um, we should talk about the loss function. The loss function is actually how a neural network figures out if it's wrong or not. So in this case, we're using a very simple loss function. It doesn't always have to be this loss function. It can be something different. But for the purposes of this neural network, it's going to be one half multiplied by the uh, expected output minus the prediction squared. Um, uh, is the derivative of this gonna be easy or hard? Very easy, right? Um, and it's set up that way purposely. So again, it could be different values, uh, I mean, a different equation. But uh, what all loss functions should do, no matter what shape they, no matter what form they take, is that they should be able to calculate that, um, that uh, little orange vertical line, the distance between you know, the expected and the predicted. Um, that curve over there, is actually representational of another important concept in neural networks, and it's called gradient descent. So basically, you want to be able to correct your weights based off of how wrong it is. And depending on the derivative of this loss function, it actually tells you while you're moving backward through the neural network whether or not you should move your weights up or down. And all you wanna do is move in the opposite direction of your derivative, right? Because if you're very steep on the loss function, then you wanna move down. Like, if it's very steep downwards, okay, I'm just losing my train of thought. But you, you correct yourself based off of how the loss function derivative. And that brings us to back propagation. So back propagation is always happens after you run the calculation and get a prediction. And that prediction is compared to the loss function, and then afterward, you move backwards from the neural network and calculate derivatives so you can adjust the weight. Um, and so it looks like that kind of graphically. You see a lot of derivatives going on there, and um, it's kind of like a more generalized chain rule for derivatives, where you're moving in reverse order 
and taking their derivatives to figure out which direction should the weights be moving to correct so that we can have less loss. Um, and then afterwards, there's actually one more component. So if you remember from our example, we have a bunch of zeros, and we just took a whole bunch of derivatives moving backwards. What's our correction? Zero. Zero. So because it's zero, that means that we don't get to adjust the weights, but we do get to adjust something else, and it's called bias. So it's kind of rare for the boundary that we draw to be f focused around the origin. And so we have to take into that into account. If you remember from the previous uh, slide where there was a graph and it drew that line and it was moving down, it wasn't centered around the origin. And so it pops the bias, I mean, it's up to the bias to make sure that that line is in the correct position so that whatever the line that is drawn can be the correct boundary that it needs to be. So even though we don't get any weight adjustments, we can still adjust the bias as illustrated by these two diagrams. I know it might be a little bit hard to see, but the upper right is what has occurred after one forward propagation and one backward propagation. Can you see how that is? Because you can see that the bias, the B on the upper section, is now 0.125, right? And so you can imagine that, okay, there's a little bit of a shift in the boundary that I just made. And then afterwards, on the bottom left-hand corner, we can see the prediction that has happened after a full forward propagation and a full backward propagation. Now we're making another forward propagation to get us a prediction of 0.469. So is that better or worse than 0.5 for 0, 0 in an OR gate? It's, it's better. Right, it's moving in the right direction, so it's working. <clears throat> if you guys don't believe what I'm saying, there's math. Uh, you can see the math on the article. It's worked out very cleanly and neatly for you there. All right, so um, basically this brings us to an, the hyperparameter zone. So the concepts of hyperparameters is essentially what uh, I would think data scientists and people working with artificial intelligence, they think about the hyperparameters pretty much most of their job, I think. I don't, I don't know if that's accurate for every single field of utilizing a model in a neural network, but hyperparameters are really important towards the accuracy and consistency of a machine learning model or a neural network. And so in this case, one of those important hyperparameters is how many times you actually run the iterations to adjust the weights, which is iterations, um, and then how many, uh, how many steps you take when you alter and calculate the derivatives to, calculate, uh, to move the weights. So you can see that in these parabolic examples, if you have a larger uh, learning rate, then that means you take more steps and you kind of hurdle towards the minimum points much more quickly. Um, but you can also see, I don't know if you can make the immediate connection, but there's a little bit of a balance going on here. If your learning rate is really, really tiny, then you're going to have to make a lot of iterations because you're going to make very slow progress towards the correct point. But if your learning rate is very large, you're going to overshoot. Can you visually see that on the par parabola? You overshoot, and then that means you have to move in the opposite direction, and you're also very slow. So you can see how you need to think about these hyperparameters, especially these two, where you need to figure out what's an appropriate learning rate and what's an appropriate iteration for the circumstances that I'm using this neural network in. And it varies widely, um, de depending on the complexity of the data, complexity of the neural network, all sorts of stuff. Um, and a lot of the times, people kind of just chalk it up to trial and error, but sometimes you can try and um, logic your way through that. And so now a lot of the times, one of the, uh, one of the big applications for neural network is processing batches of data. And we just, we were only patches, uh, per, uh, processing single data values. That's not very good because it's going to be very slow if we have batches of data to get through. And we want to be able to process the entire set of data simultaneously so that the weights can be adjusted with everything taken into account, right? So if you just do it one by one at single point values, not only will it be very slow, but it can introduce some problems 
into your corrections. So instead of looking at a loss function, now we're moving on and looking at a cost function. And so a cost function is basically the same thing, except you're taking into account every data value that you need to as a sum. And then the one half is still sitting there and you still have a square. And then now, because of the nature of y, it has shifted from a single data value and it became a vector. Uh, we will see our data values taken to the shape of matrices later. All right, as you can see, they have now taken a different form um, and we can uh, calculate the gradient descent for the back prop uh, after the back propagation using uh, matrices in batches. So it just goes through the entire um, set of data and then figures it out from there. So all the calculations now use um, these uh, suite of tools that are stored in NumPy. So NumPy allows you to utilize, you know, even full-blown tensors, but in this case we're just using arrays, uh, NumPy arrays and matrices. Um, and it makes this whole process a lot easier. Because you can see with the Z, instead of it being just a linear combination, now it's a dot product, but NumPy gives it to you out of the, bro uh, out of the box with NP dot, right? So that's a function that, that is used um, when you're uh, kind of directly using uh, kind of batch calculations. And so you always see machine learning and neural networks coupled with NumPy for that reason. Um, and so obviously these numbers are kind of gonna go over your head really fast because there's so many of them, but I just wanted to illustrate how just going across down the line, they're all getting altered and they're all getting calculated and then the weights come back down in kind of like an outward inward motion and adjust. Now, if you can see, remember how we were decreasing um, when we had the zero, zero and then we went down from 0 0.5 back to 0 0.46 or something? If you look at the bottom, which is the results of the top propagation forward and back, the first iteration, you can see that the 0 0.509 went in the wrong direction. Um, and that's because everything is being processed at the same time. However, overall, the cost function decreased um, as a result of all of the different values being moved. Some of them moving in the wrong direction, but you can see that a lot of them have been moving in the right direction. And over the iterations, it is assumed that the corrections are going to be more and more precise until the cost functions are so completely limited that it's negligible as the iterations go past. All right, so now that we kind of understand it for or, let's go ahead and make it a little bit more complex and use XOR. Is everyone familiar with the XOR gate? Okay, so you know that the XOR gate kind of has, does, you can't solve that with a linear boundary, right? because the two reds are kind of positioned in that way and the two greens, the ones, they're di uh, diagonally opposed. If you tried to draw a straight line, you'd, you wouldn't succeed making a boundary for this. So you introduce a hidden layer. Well, actually, before I skip it, let's talk about feature engineering. Um, feature engineering is a way for you to improve the patterns in your data, the pattern recognition in your data, um, it, it add extra information so that it can be processed e easier in your neural network model by synthetically calculating additional results. So for example, in the XOR gate, you could actually solve this problem without any hidden layers by engineering an extra feature where it's just X1 times X2 and then actually gives you a way of figuring out where each, uh, where the boundary should go. Um, and so that's one way of solving this problem. But the more like real world uh, kind of scenario, because a lot of uh, neural networks have this, is a hidden layer. And so you think of it as what, what it was before, but you can now scale it up. And it also allows these calculations to have multiple directions to move in. And then particular hidden layer uh, nodes are going to fire differently. And that would increase the ability of your neural network to process more, uh, more complex patterns. Um, and there's, uh, you, if you watch, uh, walk through like a machine learning 
um, kind of exercise that doesn't use neural networks, you know about underfitting and overfitting, you still have that problem with neural networks. It can still happen. And so the complexity of the neural network is directly tied towards how dense your hidden layer can be and how, you know, how many hidden layers, uh, how many layers your, net uh, your network has, all of that kind of stuff. And those are all hyperparameters that you can adjust. You can actually construct a pretty complex hidden, uh, hidden layer and a neural network in turn with the, the code, pro, uh, code example that I'm going to show you. Um, and they're all hyperparameters that you have to think about when you're applying a neural network to one of the problems that you might try to solve in the future. So this is all the math. It's um, <laughs> the creator of the article did it by hand, and I just looked at it, and I was like, yeah, that's rough. Um, that's just why we have computers do it. But if you do work, it, work through it by hands, you will have a really, really great understanding um, as to how the numbers pass through and alter the weights. It's, it's very kind of illustrative of how you might need to tinker with the hyperparameters. But we're gonna do that kind of illustrative process with uh, repeated toy examples, different examples uh, on different types of data. So, but one thing that I wanted to point, out, uh, point to you is this, all, of the, all of the transformative nodes, the Zs, they have biases attached to them. So even though the, the nodes in the, the three nodes in the center, even though they're kind of, what, what you can see is adding, you still need that transformative node there. It's not gonna work if you don't have it, but that just means that you can iteratively design the hidden, the hidden layer to include that, what you can, I guess, call like preprocessor node of passing this mathematical information, just making sure it's ready, and then sticking it inside of the activation. Okay, so with that being said, um, I'm going to just hit the small example. Um, I don't know if you already have it open, but it, it's up here. Can anyone, everyone see that? So I'm not going to be doing any live coding, um, but you can feel free to change it however you want. It's also on a weird thing called REPL, R-E-P-L. It's not a Jupyter Notebook, but you don't need to sign up. It will still allow you to mess with it. And if you wanna keep it, you can actually navigate to um, actually the repository here, which we can post somewhere, I think. That repository gives you a whole bunch of examples. It's pretty big and kind of overwhelming, but you should be able to read through the really great comments and figure out a lot more information from this small example. Okay, so here I have my REPL open, and basically I just wanted to walk you through some of the notable examples, I mean notable parts of the, this toy example. So the activation function is this guy, and, just, and because it's just a simple um, equation, dim the lights. Sorry. Is it here? Okay, I see it. So, front one, is that better? Is this hard to see? I can actually, yeah, it does look a bit blurry. Let me try scrolling in. a bit better. Okay, yeah. So hopefully you can see that. Um, I just wanted to go over the sigmoid layer because a lot of the times people think that the Im implementation of neural networks has to be super, super duper complicated. This example kind of illustrates that it's not. This is just, the, the sigmoid layer is the activation function and it's what allows you to pack the numbers into the appropriate range and it also is nonlinear. Um, you kind of get both the forward and the backward um, just with this code. Now I'm going to try and define some of the symbols that you see. Z was the, the transformation node that you saw before, it was the preprocessor. And then you kind, of go, you, you kind of see the programming implementation of the equation that you see before. And then backward 
the upstream gradient was the gradient that it saw beforehand. So the gradient calculation, the derivative, that was what it was saw in the previous node. And then that gives you the, that is the derivative of the sigmoid function. So first we're going to talk about the initial, uh, initialization of the neural network itself. The initialization, um, basically the main thing that we're going to be looking into is the randomization of the weights. So the randomization of the weights is pretty important because depending on the circumstances of your neural network, you might need to randomize it with different methodologies. So for example, uh, plane, you know, it just ran, uh, it initializes them randomly as expected, but Xavier is a randomization that's used in much larger data sets that prevent the spread from being too um, chaotic as to not being able to be used by the neural network. And I forget what HE is, but I use, I end up using Xavier quite a bit, so I had to look it up. I, I feel guilty if I, if I don't know what that is. All right, and then this is the cost function. Again, it's just calculations. And then the linear layer itself. So as you can see, it's divided into the concepts that I talked about in the beginning, where you have the initialization, you randomize the nodes with the initialized parameters function, and then you prepare Z with a bunch of zeros, and that's uh, NP uh, zeros, punches in the correct amount of space in an array or a matrix so that it can, uh, based off of your input on the shape. And the shape of an NP array is like a tuple. Uh, you can print it out if you want to see it, um, but it depends on your, what you're doing with your inputs. Um, and so NumPy just allows you to do all sorts of these really great like vector manipulations and calculations. Um, and so you end up having to familiarize, familiarize yourself with that library very quickly. This one contains the simple functions and they're pretty self-explanatory. You see NP dot, which is the matrix dot operation, and then you see NP dot sum. And so also the parameters are written to correspond to the article. So W is the weights and B is the bias. And so you can see the adjustment happening there. So has anyone already hit run or, all right. So if you hit run, basically you can see that this is our example and these, uh, these are the expected outputs. And then we label it for 5,000 iterations or epochs. Is that how you say it? Epoch? Okay. And then the learning rate is gonna be one, which means we're not gonna be multiplying any of the derivatives or uh, with any values, it's just gonna be multiplied by one, they're gonna stay the same, because it's appropriate for this uh, toy example. And then we're gonna initialize two linear layers, and the linear layers um, in this case are the same, uh, same shape as the diagram that we saw before. And it's a two, it's a kind of a two layer, and then one of them is the hidden layer. And so they kind of pass through each of those individual nodes that are initialized. You can pretty easily alter what's happening, but you just need to make sure that it kind of corresponds to whatever you punch in as the X and the Y, just so it doesn't throw errors. And then this for loop is pretty standard. It just loops through the iterations that you specified, and then it saves your calculations into, and uh, calculates the costs and sticks it inside of this array here, or list, and then it's just going to print out the results. So it's pretty easy to understand the output when done in this way. So you could actually see the graphs of it, and unfortunately I think it's, it's cutting, so I'm gonna have to describe what's at the bottom. But you can see the cost rapidly decreasing in kind of like a, a curve fashion where it starts getting very, very, very close to zero. And that's what you want to see, but that doesn't mean that your neural network is working properly. Um, I just so happen to know that based off of this example, it gets 100% because it's only four, like, you know, it's very simple here. So it gets 100% very easily. 
So um, it's kind of a bummer that I don't get to see my entire output. I think it's because I scrolled in, so let me just refresh and see if that fixes anything. Mm, is that better? No. Okay, so I'll just scroll out for now, and you can see this unformatted output. The expected results is 0, 1, 1, 0, and then it has the weights iterated by that, dec uh, uh, kind of described by decimals, not weights, sorry, predictions, and they're rounded by a threshold. So that 0 0.03 rounds to zero, so you get an, a prediction of zero, and so on, and you can see it has 100% accuracy. Um, all right, so all the way up till now, does anyone have any questions? Guess, just a show of hands, was this simpler or more complex than what you were expecting? Sorry, what's the show of hands for simpler and more complex? I just realized what I said. I <laughs> just like, hey, assign it to me. <laughs> All right, raise your hands if it was simpler than what you expected. Okay, so can I pick on one of you guys? Why did you feel like it was simpler than what you expected? If anyone wanted to volunteer. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, especially for this toy example, yeah. But it's just like, it seems like logistic regression with extra steps. But that's what happens with a linear layer. Yep? Yeah, the classes divide the information a lot better. It's a very well-made toy example that I did not make. Please do not credit me. <laughs> so it allows you to kind of divide everything. But even though it kind of looks like a really simpler, simple linear regression example, let's push this guy. Okay, so let's try and get it to identify patterns in an array of zeros and ones. See if it can do that. So um, I'm going to do a particular example, but you guys don't have to make these changes yourself, but I just wanted to illustrate how you can alter the inputs and see how the outputs kind of correspond. So based off of how this is programmed, if I just make sure that all of my data is uniform in terms of like length and stuff like that, um, then that means that I can just punch in as many as I want and this two layer hidden network will process all of that information. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to punch in some preliminary data to see if the neural network can identify a pattern where it wants to select for four digit, uh, sorry, f binary strings of length of four with ones that are together. Okay, so that means zero, one, one, zero outputs a one, and one, one, zero, zero also outputs a one, but if you have zero, one, zero, one, then it outputs a zero. Does that make sense? Okay, so you guys can try whatever data input or output you want, just go ahead and try and get this neural network to be able to identify um, the particular pattern where two ones are together. They're adjacent to each other, okay? So you can, you can just watch if you don't wanna uh, code. So I'm just gonna go ahead and program a bunch of zeros. Uh, make sure that they're not the same. That looks good, I think. And then I'm also going to give a, an extra one. I think I'll just do zero, 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 one. Okay, cool. And then now those are all negative outputs, okay? The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do my positives now. And I'm not going to get all of them because I just want to kind of illustrate how this neural network can fail as well. So I'm not going to exhaustively specify every single possible success, but I'm going to uh, specify plenty of failures. So these two are successes here, and the previous ones are all failures, or they're all neg uh, negative responses. So that means that my corresponding expected output in the Y should be this guy. Also, for those of you that wanna follow along, this code is available on this one down here. Sorry if I wrote it a bit small. Okay, 
All right, so I think that looks good. One, two, three, four, five. I should have five zeros here and two ones. That makes sense, right? So now that they're corresponding, this looks pretty flimsy, right? It doesn't seem like it's, it's going to give me a correct output. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but the biggest reason is that you take the number of permutations for a binary string, and it's much larger than this data set. So based off of that information alone, it shouldn't be able to get very good predictions out of this. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're gonna go all the way down here, and then we're going to specify, hey, we got an X test, and then we have a Y test. And it does exactly what it says on the tin. Basically, you're gonna feed it into that predict function on line 78, and see if it successfully predicted it. Obviously, this was our X or example, so we're gonna to have to adjust it so that involves uh, binary strings of length four, right? And as an added challenge to the neural network, we're gonna do something that we haven't done to it before in its short lifespan as a simpleton. It's not going to be able to, it's never seen this data before. So if whatever data that you punched in, it doesn't have to be exactly like mine, whatever data that you might have had, don't um, repeat it in the training set and the test set. Try and see if it can make the correct prediction when it saw that it's never seen that binary string before. So in my case, I want to see if it works on all ones. Would it work on all ones? Maybe. I want to see if it fails when the second, the second one is a one. I also want to see if it fails like that and like that. Okay, so the expected output should be zero, 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 one based off of the pattern that I just specified, okay? All right, so I need to mark that out. Okay, does anyone have any predictions on the predictions? Do you guys think it's gonna do it great, 100%, or is it gonna fail miserably and get nothing? Or maybe in between? I think rationally we would probably have it maybe do, do, uh, be correct maybe 60% of the time, I don't know. All right, um, assuming that everything corresponds properly, it might error, I might have made a mistake. Um, it should just run all of its epochs, uh, iterations. All right. Okay, again, I'm having problems with the scroll. Okay, so it got it 50% of the time. Its predictions were zero, one, zero, zero. So pretty far off, right? So kind of our hypothesis was pretty, uh, pretty square in a way, at least what I, what I was just saying out loud, is that when you pass in this data, because there are so much more patterns that can be identified with this small data set, it's gonna struggle a lot trying to identify, especially considering that it only has two layers, right? So we're kind of exploring the limitations. But let's say we added more failures and more successes and see how many failures and successes we need to add before it successfully predicts the correct um, pattern or figures out whether or not it meets the requirements. So here, let's just do one, zero, zero, one, and I wanna make sure there are no repeats, that's a repeat, so let's just go zero, Zero, one, zero. Okay, I don't have it down there either. And then that's just another zero. And then I wanna add some more successes. There's a lot of stuff we can add, a lot of different possibilities. And it's kind of tedious work. But I think it's a good exploration for a simple neural network. And then maybe we can add another success like this. And then maybe we should add more failures as well. Um, there's actually a, this alternating count here. 
right? So that one's also a failure. Want to add that? And then let's add an extra success. Let's see. Is that one already used? No, it doesn't look like. One. All right. One, two, three, four, five. Six. Ooh, missing a comma. OK. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. OK, I think that'll work. We have um, a little bit more data now. See if that makes a difference. All right, so it's exactly the same. Kind of it made the exactly the same predictions here. So one of the interesting things, though, actually, no, it didn't make the exact same predictions. Sorry. It just made the same count. The only one that it predicted would succeed was the first one. But at that point, it's kind of like a no-brainer, right? It makes t complete sense why it would just be the first one that's predicted correctly. And all of the other ones kind of end up failing. failing. Oh, no one caught that. I'm sorry. OK, so the first one should be a success. So the accuracy should be 60%. So it actually, um, it was 60% both times. But it flipped down, and it didn't get this one. But if you kind of change that so that it has three ones together, you can actually look at the data that I personally fed it, and you can see how it probably ends up knowing that the threshold, if it has three ones in it, it's a success. So let's just test that. Right? And I think a big part of that is because it already saw the three, I think the three ones. So it got 100% there, right? So this one it already saw as well, so it's going to predict that, I think, correctly. It would be interesting if it didn't get it, and so it gets 100%. But the full, all of the ones it got without needing to see that, and then these ones both, because of the low amount of ones, it says this is probably not it. This is not the pattern. It doesn't fit the pattern. OK? Do any have any questions up to this point? All right. 